off. I think this is a a good first part of this video. I will continue talking. I probably will place this in another, in other videos. Because I feel incomplete about what I was saying about uh, our growth and regulation. Or I was speaking about how emotional regulation may be the the I I would dare to say the critical piece in our growth acknowledgement of emotional realities at least again acknowledgement that our emotional upbringings are up to date white in a widespread fashion they are incomplete, often incorrect. And they generate and produce the many, many of the vices and hurts and mistrusts. in this world, in this human world. These greeds, <laughs> greeds, hunger, hunger for more. These dissatisfactions, these senses of, uh, no, purposelessness, no, no. Um, So about, about emotional regulation, I was saying, I meant to come back to physical regulation and speak that, that as I was saying, there are practices that people have, practices that people um, take on, and very often they are meant to, to, to practice these regulations, physical regulation. Exercises for physical regulations are well known. Oh, I will move the mouse a little more. They are. Um, they, we have sports. We have going. We have gymnastics. We have uh, anything that we can <laughs> that we can attribute to the body. Um, <clears throat> we have yoga these days. We have Pilates. We have running, walking, cycling, hiking, mountain climbing, horse riding. The, phys the training of the physical body. Um, perhaps uh, dancing. We have dancing. Dancing. It, it is a subtler, deeper way of exploring that. It is a, it is a form of physical regulation that we practice. Um, and in the case of sports, well, the actual physical mm. strengthening, firm, uh, affirming of our physical body and in the same motif of things for the emotional regulation we also have practices that we have developed and and well there can be so many things um, some that are coming up in our widespread culture are things like psychology like where people are actually have psychological problems related to emotions and they are attempting to express it to allow the emotions to flow. Because the problem with, with emotions often is that they are, we have these emotions and they wish to be expressed and they are suppressed. They are repressed, they are, they are inhibited, they are said, no, this is not the right time for them. And so we learn to suppress them and to inhibit them. But we are not told how to, what to do with them, how to process them, what to do with that anger. Because it stays. It stays. The anger stays if it is not processed. And then we have people trying to go and hit the walls and, 
screaming out in the woods or just being mean to the people around them. Because there is this anger inside of them that is that doesn't have it anywhere to go, that it's undirected and it can accumulate and accumulate and accumulate and build up pressure inside of us so much that we every now every now and again we'll need to let off let let off steam exactly as the phrasing goes we need to let out some steam because the pressure is building in us because these bodies these this emotional body that we have is capable of holding these things <laughs> but it's not designed it's not meant to hold these emotions for so long it it gets damaged if that get, if that happens <clears throat> And I, I would attribute also practices like art and music and social contacts, social uh, relationships, actually friendships and gatherings that also to emotional regulations, emotional regulation. We require some kind of, uh, we as humans, we, we, are, we require some kind of approval to be, uh, for us humans to function correctly, to be seen. We, we're looking for approval, for validation, for someone to tell me, yes, I, I did that correctly. Yes, I am, I am worthy. I am, I am of value to something, to someone outside of me. Oh, okay, then, then the emotional body feeds off of that. It feels good. And so friendships are good <laughs> to be able to acquire that, to have that. And things like art and music and anything that where we can express things, that is in a way the, 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 the counter to that, where we have expression, where we have emotions within us that have not been expressed, that are like uh, trying to come out in some way or another, like just stagnant sadnesses or mm, boiling angers or just uh, these scabbed, ugh. <sighs> putrefying, putrefied resentments and frustrations. These art and music, they are like ways of just uh, letting them go, at least a little, at least a little. Because I think that they cannot truly be let go if If they are not, if they are not given the original cause that they were brought for, like that is that is why often we have we hold such uh, pointed memories of things that happened to us, of things that hurt us. That one person, that one classmate hurt us. That one thing that my mother did or did not do hurt us, and it stays. It stays inside, and it hurts, and it. And it's there, and it's this thorn, this wound that is energetically linked to that memory. And to truly be released, I think for the most part, it needs that association to be seen and to be somehow released, which is what psychotherapy often does, or art therapy, or music therapy, or I... <laughs> I don't know all the kinds of therapy that exist. But I know that people have them, they train in them, and they use them because they are seen to be useful. And yet, so many of these would not be so necessary if we could, as a culture, inculcate emotional regulation into our educations.
And so when usually in our teenage years, well, I don't mean to provide rules or even patterns, <clears throat> but af organically, I think that after the emotional maturity or, or at least Yes, and subsequently to the, the part of emotional regulation, we begin to develop our mental bodies in a more uh, focused fashion. And it is then that also naturally and interestingly, uh, our schools and in our universities pose the most begin to pose more acute ways of thinking. Mathematics and physics and chemistry they all begin to be to 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 be given in a more uh, precise manner, because it is uh, because I imagine it has been seen that then uh, humans teenagers actually respond to these mental. Uh, growth, but I do not mean to actually state ages or so, but mental regulation, I believe that that is also a part that we humans naturally can and are designed to grow into and to learn to use and to regulate. Um, And, hmm, and I believe that our, in our culture, the most prominent example I can find of a practice that encourages mental regulation is meditation. Because it is the observing of the thoughts, of the direction that our mind takes the places it wants to go and how it reacts to the also to the to the reactions that are coming from our 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 denser lower bodies the emotional and the ethereal and the etheric and the and the physical bodies how does it how does our mind react to all of that can we train it to regulate it, regulate all of them correctly? And by correctly, the image that comes to mind is that of a parent uh, <clears throat> who has many children and they are all asking for different things, They're asking for attention or they, he, hurt him, so he hurt himself or she uh, wants a friend to play with or, or these all these children they have different needs and the parent if he's unregulated if he's he or she is untrained they are are prone to react to them and to there's a hurt and then they go in and they they hold them and they, they give them all their attention for a long way like they they are they they act reactively afraid because they're like, oh, I need to take care of this, I need to take care of this. And, and they are not able to regulate themselves yet. I am I'm not a parent myself, so I, I don't have personal experience about that. But that is the image that comes to mind. And, and I believe that our... A regulated mind is a very powerful thing to have. It's useful. I believe it is the tool that has made, that has been used by so very many of the so-called uh, 
geniuses and discoverers and ex people who were curious about things and decided to structure the things in the world in their minds and to provide them structure, enough structure, so that it could be expressed back into the physical world in a systemized manner. And these people have produced our sciences, these sciences have produced our technologies, and they are responsible for so many of the benefits that we modern humanity enjoy, at least a part of it. Because I, a, a working professional, an educated working professional who is able to financially take care of himself, lost my train of thought there. Ah, because I, a <clears throat> professional, working professional who is educated, working professional who is financially able to take care of himself and in other ways, have uh, a privileged position in this world in this human world where there is much lack of education, lack of <clears throat> resources. A lack of sometimes opportunities to develop the best version of each human. And from this so-called privileged position, I wish to speak and say these things that I believe are important to the subsequent growth of humanity. God takes care of us. Even when it seems that 
she she it doesn't we have the role of taking care of the small piece of us that has been given to us to take care of. And to do so properly, we need to understand what we do and whatever we do, why we do it. That why is the natural curiosity that we are given. It wishes to trace events and objects and phenomena in the world to their causes. Because it recognizes that all phenomena in this universe have causes. It is seen clearly with children when they come and innately at some age they perhaps realize the, the law of cause and effect and they begin to question why this? Why that? Why that? Why this? Why that? Why this? Why money? Why sky? Why clouds? Why house? Why dog? Why why me? Why why clothes? Why why? It's the attempted linking of phenomena to causes because we wish to know the causes. And it seems to me that as a, as a species as a whole, as a, as, a, as a culture, we have reached the point where the wise need to step into the esoteric realms. I think that science and material observation has done very much to explain the causes of the physical all through the physical as well, as much as it has been able to. And that it has reached the limit, a near limit, of what the physical can provide, or what, what the, at least the material, physical, so far measurable physical can provide. And we need to... to seek further in order to continue linking and linking this web of whys. Do we not know, would we not want to know why we are alive? <laughs> do we not know, do we not want to know why we suffer, why we enjoy, why we have pain, why we have <clears throat> genders? Why we have uh, 
malice, why we have altruism, why, why we have generosity, why we have love. What is love? I believe that this search has been stunted by the shame applied to the esoteric subjects. Cultural shame. And I believe it is important that we stop. Hmm. Not so much that we stop shaming, trying to pr provide, produce shame and others, that's that's throwing the issue somewhere else. It is that we, we need to stop acquiescing to the shame that we feel within us, to the fears that we feel within us. <clears throat> and having all these internal, hidden, often unspoken fears of so many little things in the world. I'm afraid. I don't want to be. I don't, I'm not going to have any money. I'm afraid that I'm not going to have any friends. I'm afraid that I'm not going to. I'm not going to find a place to live. I'm afraid that I'm not, my family will not like me. I'm afraid that I will not find a partner that will like me. I'm afraid that I will not, that I will be alone and I will continue to be alone. And I'm afraid that I will... That I will fail. I'm afraid that I will fail. And so I do not even try. So many stunted efforts because of this acquiescing to our fears. We acquiesce to our fears because they somehow hurt in a sense, because when we feel them, when we see them, when we feel them, our reaction, the natural reaction of our bodies, of our unconscious bodies, is to, to the classical fight or flight. <clears throat> we react to them. Oh, something needs to be done. Hold on. What? Fear. Death. Oh, aggression. What is it? Empty? What do I do? And at that moment, when we are when we give in to the unconscious reaction, we have lost the conscious ability to think and to think in terms of why and to attribute and to link that that causality between this fear that we feel. Here, here, this fear that we feel here, and this, and the cause that we perhaps could have observed, but when we react unconsciously, we, we, what we're taking, what our bodies are taking care of in that moment are, is, is our safety. <laughs> <laughs> And we not die, and if we not, okay, we don't die, okay, then, uh, then that's all. <laughs> that's all that matters, and the fear is <clears throat> stays there. The fear can only be understood if it is faced, if it is seen, if we are willing to truly stay and see. And not run away, and not try to shove it up, shove it away. 
but truly stare into it and acknowledge to ourselves whether out loud or not. I... I'm afraid of that thing. Why? Why am I afraid of that thing? And we humans have a wonderful capacity I have experienced to find the whys of things, particularly of our own emotional and mental bodies, or from physical bodies as well, of everything. We have this capacity to find the whys if we focus on them. If we ask <laughs> truly, why? Why is that? And feel into it a capacity that is not widely spoken of in traditional Western culture or modern culture. I will call it modern culture. <clears throat> traditional modern culture. It's not spoken of it of because it's not widespread. Wait, what practice were they talking about? The holding. The holding. And the seeing of the fear and thinking, well, why? Oh no, the capacity to find, find the whys. Once something is identified. <laughs> um, we have that capacity. I found amazing experiences where something in the body tells me something and I am drawn to it for some reason or another, some force that shows up as subtle inklings. <clears throat> I'm drawn to parts in my body and, and I touch or I inquire into it sincerely and and if the fear or the or the situation is willing the cause appears the cause truly shows up within us we know it we feel it we under we understand it if only for <coughs> If only for an instant, but it's there. And it is then in our, our task, our responsibility to develop that capacity so that we can know, well, what is the cause of each of my pains? What is the cause of each of my fears. They have a cause. Even if I don't remember it now. Even if I don't remember it ever. They have a cause. And the acknowledging of that, I think, is valuable. Because then we don't end up attributing the suffering that we have in life. <clears throat> because we humans, I believe, do suffer in this life. We don't end up attributing it to randomness, to pointlessness, to meaninglessness. And, and then come to believe that the world has no point. I really hope that the sound is still recording. <laughs> oh. 
overall, we can be driven by trust. And if we allow that, then I believe that all the parts of us, all the parts that we are, our bodies are, and our cultures, our societies as a whole are, can and will begin to flow more freely. whatever that entails. <clears throat> the release of long-held pains and fears, I believe can be violent. I have experienced it being violent. And when it is when that is their nature that is perhaps necessary it is in the nature of things and yet this violence can be regulated as well may it be regulated May it be knowingly regulated when it comes up. <sighs> because there is no need to keep destroying our physical world. We can. <laughs> we can. It feels so much better when we know, when, when I know, that's all I can speak for, when I know why I do things. That is all.